Okay, hi, welcome back. Um, this is part two of uh, the Road to Revolution, where we are discussing uh, the, the events that were leading up to the Americans declaring independence from Great Britain. Uh, and we had left off where, you know, the British government had sent over um, a number of new troops, the Redcoats, to the colonies to enforce the new trade regulations after the French and Indian War, which the colonists the American colonists were not happy about because they felt like this was um, taking away their freedom, which they had grown so used to during that hundred year period of salutary neglect. And they really resented not only these, uh, these laws, these taxes especially, but they also came to resent the very men who were there in these red coats who kind of became sort of the symbols of the king's tyranny. Um, and, you know, as the phrase went, taxation without representation is tyranny. Remember that um, the colonists were unhappy because they felt that they lacked the voice in the British government that they thought they should have, um, going back to these old philosophies of, of the Enlightenment. Um, and they were British philosophies, men like John Locke. And um, so they, they felt that these taxes were unfair because they were not being asked um, what their opinion was, if you will. Uh, they had no voice in the, in the government. And of course, the British Parliament saw these uh, measures as reasonable simply because they had paid for this uh, costly war in order to gain more land for the colonists, and, and they needed the colonists, they felt that the colonists should only pay their fair share um, in terms of defending this new land and this new territory and paying for the war that they had fought. Um, and then, you know, you ha we ended where, you know, the, these new troops that are being sent over, they, they don't really have a place to live. And so to add insult to injury, the colonists are being asked to, um, to house these, these soldiers. They're not being asked, actually, they're being forced to house these soldiers, it was a law that was passed called the Quartering Act. Um, and so that just kind of like rubs it, you know, just kind of even rubs it further in their faces that they are kind of um, being told what to do, they're not being asked, and so they're getting more and more upset. But still by this point, remember, not that many people outside of Massachusetts uh, really were that upset about it. They had some support from people from Virginia, remember people like Patrick Henry, uh, who were looking at the events in Massachusetts and saying, you know, this could happen to us and it's a matter of principle. But for the most part, the, the, the sense of unfairness was really surrounding the people in New England. Um, but even still, even among the people in New England, there, weren't, there wasn't anybody that was yet talking about revolting. They just were trying to get the king's attention. You know, hey, you know, we have a say here, these acts are unfair. Um, and, you know, they, no one was yet quite mentioning the word independence. Maybe people were thinking about it, but nobody was really talking out loud about it. Um, so that's kind of where we left off. Let's see if I can do this right today. There we go. Um, and so remember, we're, as we look through these, uh, these, these, events leading up to the Americans declaring independence, you want to look at, we want to look at both sides, both points of view, um, because that's something important in history that we have to look at, uh, and an event from all different um, perspectives. So this might be a good note-taking strategy, if you are taking notes, um, to do sort of a two-column kind of note, uh, you know, T-chart, where you put the, you know, maybe the act over here in the margin. Um, and then the British perspective and the colonial perspective. So um, just a little tip, but just think about these um, questions as we move along, as we talk about each event, you know, what's the British point of view, what's the colonist point of view. So here you have, uh, we're in Boston, now 1770 approximately, and um, something happens that kind of is a turning point um, and begins to convince um, other people outside of Boston certainly convinced people in Boston that the king really is tyrannical, that he is willing, um, in fact, to kill his own citizens to get his way. 
And so um, among the colonists, this was called the Boston Massacre. Um, you know, you have these kind of young, brash soldiers being sent over here. Uh, it's, it's a snowy, cold winter evening in Boston. We all know those. We've all faced those, so it's, it's very cold. But um, some crowds have gathered uh, outside of the, what was called the Customs House. That was the house that collect, you know, that where the tax collectors um, basically did their business. And the crowd swells to almost 400 people. And this crowd, some of them, not all of them, but um, Samuel Adams was a leader among the revolutionaries, those who were kind of the rabble rousers, if you will, the ones that were kind of going around and talking about how unfair these taxes were. Um, and he actually um, begins. Uh, what were called committees of correspondence. Remember, there's no email, there's no, um, there's no fax machines, there's no telephones. And so these uh, committees was a way of organizing um, these boycotts and the protests that were uh, the ways that so far the colonists had um, chosen to protest these taxes and these you know, new laws that were being passed. And so the, Sam Adams was really a leader um, in Boston and, and getting the word out to other colonies, getting the word out around Massachusetts. And so in this particular case, he sent this message through this committee of correspondence, which literally they would get on their horseback and ride through the towns and deliver these messages and talk about what was happening. Um, and he, uh, you know, so he, he organized this protest out in Boston. About 400 people end up showing up. And the, you know, the, the young soldiers are standing there and they're trying to do their job and they're trying to protect um, you know, the customs house, the tax collectors you know, building. And you know, they're kind of, Sam Adams had basically told the, these mobs, he called them his trained mobs, and he kind of would tell them how to kind of just egg on the soldiers just enough to get them, maybe even to get them to react and to, um, you know, to do something. And so he would say, kind of go right up, get right up to the to the bayonet um, or the little um, that's kind of this little thing. So if the soldier was holding it out um, and the, trying to get the crowd to back away, he would say, let them just kind of nick your, just let them nick your your neck, and then you can kind of claim, oh, police brutality. You know, he he uh, you know he he stabbed me. You know, he's um, this evil you know red coat sent over by this tyrannical king. And you know you could kind of um, you know egg on these soldiers to to kind of react. That's what they were trying to do, and um, react they did. And this is you know something that is very controversial, remains very controversial. Um, the colonists began to sort of you know there, there's this um, tension, almost palpable tension in the air. And then the colonists start kind of taunting and jeering and yelling at the soldiers and making fun of them for being lobster backs and they start throwing snowballs and aha let's look at the lobster backs and you know they're getting pelted in the face with uh with snowballs and chunks of ice and then all of a sudden one of the snowballs hits uh one of the chunks of ice actually um hit a soldier and you know there were the soldiers version of the story was a little bit different in fact they said that the colonists had um, chains and um, not sticks, but you know, big kind of um, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, batons almost. These these baton looking things, and that they were actually the colonists were actually hitting the soldiers. And so whether it was a chunk of ice or whether a colonist actually hit a soldier, uh, we really don't know. But the 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 fact is that the soldier fell over, and as he was falling. His shot, his uh, his gun went off, and the other soldiers, hearing the shot, began firing because they they were assuming that um, that the colonists were firing upon them, and so they started firing. And in the melee that ensued, um, five American colonists, unarmed American colonists, were killed. Um, one of whom um, was, you know, the the first actually was this guy named Christmas Attic. Um, he was a freed black slave who had come north and was part of this protest, and he becomes the you know famous for being the first um, to be killed in this uh, this horrible horrible incident where unarmed civilians 
were being uh, were being killed. And so, of course, according to the soul, according to the colonists, this was a massacre. And what's a massacre? A massacre is just that, right? That that these were this was an un provoked attack at these horrible soldiers um, where, you know, we're aiming to fire, we're looking for a fight, um, and the colonists were completely innocent in, you know, in this incident. And this um, picture that was drawn by one of the patriots, by one of the people that were supporting revolution, um, named Paul Revere from Boston, he, draw, he draws this picture and they send it out in these committees of correspondence. Uh, they send it out around the colonies and say, look at what's happening here in Boston. They are massacring our people. It is a massacre. We are innocently just trying to voice our opinion to our king, which is within our right to do, and these soldiers are killing us for trying to, to speak our minds. Um, of course, they don't mention the snowballs or the sticks and the, you know, the taunting and the jeering. Um, and, but when the rest of the colonies start to hear this, then it really becomes pretty real. And a lot of colonies decide, well, a lot of people in the colonies start to think, you know, maybe further action is necessary. Maybe we need to start, you know, start thinking about supporting our fellow colonists up in Boston. Um, and it just becomes more and more real. Okay. So, um, you know, we're not, still not quite certain what actually happened. The two different versions of the story, the British version of the story is much, much different um, than the English citizens, I'm sorry, the colonists, the American colonists version. They were English citizens, which was why this was so shocking that these unarmed citizens were massacred. Um, but it did reinforce the idea that the British king was oppressing his own people. And whether it was true or not, Propaganda, like the one we just saw, um, definitely convinced Americans um, that this that that you know that this was true, that this British king um, was oppressive and was tyrannical and was abusing his power. And now people started to kind of softly kind of whisper to each other that maybe we were moving towards um, towards declaring independence. It was still a really shocking idea to most Americans because they were British, remember? Um, so it was still really shock shocking. And the British government kind of realizes, oh gosh, we have a major trouble on our hands here. Um, whether they, you know, the soldiers were, were right or not in their opinion, they knew how it looked. Um, and they knew how it looked to the rest of the world. And so they end up repealing all taxes. They backtrack yet again and they kind of bow down yet again to the whim of these colonists um, and the protests. And the only tax that they leave was the tax on tea. And this is going to be, um, you know, something that, you know, the colonists are not willing to accept. Um, we're going to look at the other pictures in class. That's why I skipped over them. So uh, just um, keep that in mind. We're going to look at the, at the other pictures in class if you're dying to look at those pictures. Okay. Now the Tea Act. British government thinks they're being very fair. They think, well, we're repealing all of the other taxes. You know, um, this is a fair move that we're making. And um, the only tax they leave on is actually a tax on tea. And it's a specific type of tea. It really was a tax that was designed to give a monopoly, a monopoly to the British company um, called the British East India Company. Now remember back to the Navigation Act, the whole point of having colonies was, you know, under the mercantile theory was to regulate trade so that it, it would benefit the mother country, the mother country being Great Britain. And here's where you have an example of, of Great Britain trying to assert this authority over their colonies, over her colonies, um, trying to make it so that the colonists can only buy or will only buy British tea as opposed to tea from other, you know, from other companies in order to benefit the British East India Company. And in rea and you know, so in, in reality, what they're doing is giving a monopoly to the British East India Company. 
Now, if you don't know what a Monopoly is, but you've played the game Monopoly, then you probably do know what it is, you just don't realize it. If you think about the game Monopoly, uh, the purpose of the game, how, how do you win the game? Well, you win the game by making everybody else go bankrupt, and they have to give you all their money. And how do you do that? Well, you do that by buying up all the properties so that then you can place big taxes whenever they, whenever somebody lands on your property and you have all of the properties in that color, um, you have the ability to, you know, to do whatever you want with that. So that's what a monopoly is. Um, a monopoly is designed to eliminate competition. Once you eliminate competition, so let's say if there was um, all of a sudden Motorola gained a monopoly on the cell phone industry, nobody else could make cell phones. What could Motorola do when you went to buy a cell phone and they were the only ones that were making cell phones? Well, they know that people want their cell phones no matter what, so they can jack up the prices and they know that people are still going to pay. That's what a monopoly is. The people in the, in, you know, the tax itself actually made the British tea cheaper than it had been um, beforehand. And so they thought, well, surely the colonists will be happy with this because they're going to be paying less for their tea. Um, and yet, because it was under the label of a tax, the colonists didn't care because it was the principle. At this point, by 1773, it's the principle of the matter. No tax is going to be welcome um, because, remember, there's this whole idea of taxation without representation. And, you know, this is, um, this, this is not welcome um, at any, in any way, shape, or form no matter what, right, taxes are not welcome. And what did the colonists do in order to protest? Uh, well, they disguised themselves, if you can see in this picture, if you look closely, what they are disguised as, which is an interesting commentary on, uh, on how they viewed Native Americans, right, this ethnocentric view of Native Americans. If you look closely, you can see they are disguised with, and if, if you look even closer, you can see war paint and um, the feathers, I think it's a really interesting commentary on how they viewed Native Americans, the fact that they chose to disguise themselves in this way and not any other way. Um, but, you know, in reaction to the tax, the, the Tea Act, the tax, they boarded these ships that had docked in the Boston Harbor and they dumped all of the shipments of, of this British tea from the British East India Company into the Boston Harbor. And this cost the British East India Company, which was already pretty much going bankrupt, almost $90,000. And we're talking about $90,000 in, well, remember it's not dollars, but it's the equivalent of about $90,000 um, in today's money. That's a lot of money, right? Ninety. I'm having some trouble writing here with my little mouse, but $90,000. And of course, that's a really poor zero that I just wrote there, but uh, you get the idea. It cost the British East India Company and therefore the British government a lot of money. And the British government is really pretty much done bending over backwards now. They are not they are now, after 10 years of trying, in their opinion, of trying to be fair, of trying to listen to what the colonists want, they are fed up. And now they say, enough is enough. We need to punish this act. And this is really where the turning point moment is in history. Before this point, it was not inevitable that we were going to split away from England. Had it not been for the Boston Tea Party, we may still be speaking British, uh, you know, with a British accent. Well, British is the same as English, but speaking with a British accent at least, right? Good pip, cheerio, um, bloody hell, and, and all that good stuff. We might, you know, we might still be British. Who knows? But this punishment that the British government decides, uh, decides to inflict on the Boston colonists is really what made this um, a turning point and really kind of you know this becomes the point of no return at after 1773 um, 
this is where the colonists really begin to say, we need to split away from Britain. This is it. There's no other option. Not all colonists, but a lot of colonists in Massachusetts felt this way. The British um, punishment came in the form of what they called the coercive acts. To coerce, this is where this word coercive comes from, means to persuade someone to do something, usually by force or threat. Right? Synonyms, force, compel, constrain, oblige, enforce, right? So think about why they are calling, the British government is calling these acts the coercive acts. They are trying to now force the colonists to behave, right? Um, and this act, this coercive act, right, um, came in four parts. Those four parts um, in the colonies became known as the intolerable act. So totally different perspective, right? From the perspective of the British, they were called the coercive acts. From the perspective of the col colonists, they were called the intolerable acts. Well, what does intolerable mean, right? Whoa, that, Miss Flood, that homework you gave last night was just intolerable, right? It means unable to be endured, right? Insufferable. I cannot bear this, right? What was so bad about this, these coercive acts that the British colonists started calling them intolerable? Well, there were four parts. The first part took away uh, the right for Boston. Um, anyone arrested in Boston that was a British soldier, for example, there was a trial after the Boston Massacre where the colonists actually, um, John Adams, one of the leading founding fathers, actually defended um, the the soldiers, the, the soldiers who um, in the colonist side murdered innocent civilians um, and he actually got an innocent verdict um, and that's what made John Adams in particular really upset when under the Intolerable Act any further crimes committed by soldiers including murder would be tried by a court back in England. It would not be tried by a colonial court. And this particular is really what considered John Adams up until this point was the one who was really kind of moderate. He was the one that was pressing. Um, I don't know if you know who John Adams is. Um, you probably do if you, if you don't know. He's a very, very famous Boston um, historical figure. He's going to become the future president, the second president of the United States. Uh, let's look. Let's find a picture. Here's a good picture. Has a son that eventually becomes. Um, the, uh, I think it's the eighth president, no, it's not the eighth, uh, maybe the sixth president, I think, of the United States. Um, here's some pictures, um, you see, um, what's his name, can't think of his name, uh, Paul Giamatti plays him in the HBO series, um, he plays him very well, in fact, and we will be watching some of those in class. Um, so these are some, some pictures of this very, very famous Bostonian, um, who is one of the founding fathers, one of the leaders of, you know, in Boston that is, um, that is eventually going to lead the revolution. Um, up until this point, he does not believe that we should revolt. His cousin, Sam Adams, is the one that's going around rallying everybody behind this idea of, of independence. And John Adams is finally convinced, whoops, um, by this intolerable, by these intolerable acts that the king has gone too far, the king really is tyrannical, and he's not going to be willing to listen to the colonists anymore. Um, the second part of the act uh, was, um, was another quartering act, again, forcing the colonists um, to house these soldiers, again, just kind of pouring salt into the wound. The third part of the act um, basically took away the right to colonial assembly, which was really um, one of the things I think that was probably the most unbearable of these acts, most intolerable, because this is really, to the colonists, this is really saying you do not have the right to self-government anymore. And this was something that, again, they had grown used to. Um, you know, it was almost a necessity with England being so far away, they basically were allowing, had allowed the colonies to rule themselves, to govern themselves. They had elected legislatures, um, colonial legislatures, and they ruled over the colonies for the most part. And now Boston has, a Massachusetts legislature has been shut down and their right to self-government has been taken away. What was probably most intolerable though 
was the fact that, you know, and this was a direct, you know, if you think about the fact that this was directly in relation to what had happened in, you know, at the Boston Tea Party, the fourth part of the Intolerable Act shut down the harbor. No more harbor. Oops. The fourth part of the, of the Intolerable Act shut down the harbor until the colonists could pay back the $90,000 could pay back the $90,000 that they owed the British government by throwing this tea into the harbor and destroying this property. And this was the most unbearable because remember this is how most American colonists in Boston, a lot of American colonists made their money. Um, men like Sam Adams, John Hancock, who you might know, another famous name, um, you know, and to the, to the British government, you know, this was them cracking down on all of the smuggling that had been going on, and, you know, and certainly as, you know, again, as punishment for this, um, this horrific act, in their opinion, where they destroyed all of this property. And again, that, you know, this was, this was the punishment that the British were inflicting. And this was why they, the colonists, the American colonists in Boston, thought this was so intolerable. And now, even John Adams, who was moderate before, who was arguing against his cousin, that, um, that reconciliation with England was possible, now even John Adams starts to support separation from England or, you know, separation or independence, right? Now a lot of people are talking about that. And in fact, they decide to have a meeting, a Congress, all of the of the colonial, um, you know, all of the colonies, the thirteen colonies, um, get together in Philly. They send, you know, one or two or three, even four, maybe delegates, members representing their um, their colony, to talk about what to do. And besides the colonists from Massachusetts, most of them wanted to make up with Britain. They wanted to reconcile. They did not did not want to separate. They did not want to split with England. Why not? Well, England was the most powerful country in the world, so they benefited from being part of England. Um, and not only that, they also were wise men and they realized that separating from England was not going to come without probably a bloody and violent war, um, of which it was very likely that they would not win, because England, remember, is the most powerful country in the world. They have the best, most, you know, well-trained army in the world. Um, but John Adams is kind of leading the charge and, and basically begging, begging, begging. You have to understand what's going on in Boston. We are under siege. And so he gets the, co the, the other colonies to agree to a few things. They issue a Declaration of Rights, reasserting to Great Britain, this is what we believe, you know, all of those theories about John Law. You know, it's not fair that we're being taxed without our rep without representation in Parliament. Um, just kind of re re reminding, I guess, the King and Parliament that they are British subjects and they deserve certain rights. Okay, that's number one. Number two, they called for a complete boycott of all British products. Okay, and the British Parliament's probably not going to be happy about this because again, it's going to cost them money. And thirdly, they decide that they are going to um, meet again in Philadelphia if their demands are not met. Okay? They will meet again if their demands are not met. So those are the three things that John Adams gets the colonists to agree to, at least. It's just a very simple thing. Um, he gets them to agree um, to these three things. And I'm going to leave off there, um, just as a review. Boston is under siege. Uh, most people in Boston are, you know, at this point are feeling like, um, a lot of people at least, are feeling like um, separation is the only answer. Um, a man by the name of General Gage is sent over to organize the military occupation of Boston. He is a very hated, detested man um, in Boston. Um, you, can, you know, uh, you might recognize his name if you know anything about your, your you know, your, your state history. Um, and, you know, there is, in Boston at least, uh, the continual sort of tension that's rising and the drift towards war um, that's continuing with the, uh, the, the violence that's being inflicted on the, on the tax collectors, 
on anyone really, on anyone that disagrees with um, with Sam Adams and his supporters of, of independence. Anybody that speaks out against him is facing this violence. Um, they begin to collect muskets, which are guns. That's all that, that fancy word is. These are guns. They begin to stockpile guns, as many as they can. Remember, they're not a trained army. Boy, I cannot write with this thing. <laughs> um, they are not a trained army. Um, but they do begin drilling these Minutemen. These colonial militias begin drilling out in the countryside. It's not countryside now. It's out in areas that are, are pretty citified now, um, up north of Boston, near Lexington and Concord, uh, Massachusetts. Um, so you see that they start drilling, they start training um, the militias, they start, you know, they start trying to collect guns and gunpowder and muskets and, and other, um, they, try, they try to start collecting them just in case it happens to get to the point where they, that they declare a revolution. Um, and other colonial assemblies are coming out in support, specifically Virginia. Remember, that's the state of Patrick Henry. Um, other colonies start to assemble their colonial militias, again, just in case, right? Just in case the military is sent to these other, right? Just in case the king decides he's going to kind of wreak his tyrannical havoc um, on these other colonies, they start... Um, they start drilling and they start collecting muskets and gunpowder and other war supplies. And yet still, remember, in most cases, most colonists favor reconciliation. They do not want to split with Britain. They want something to be done. They all agree that this is not fair, what's happening, especially in Boston, especially after the Intolerable Act. But most colonists do not want to go to war with Great Britain. Okay, so we're going to leave off there. We're going to pick up uh, here in class, um, and so uh, that's about it. See you in class. Have a nice night.